So hello, uh, hello, welcome to everyone to the second edition of our online discussion, A Feminist Exploration on Demography. My name is Neil Data. I'm the Secretary of the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Rights. And um, I'm very proud to be here with you to host this event with the support of the Heinrich, of the Heinrich Boll Foundation European Union and the Gunther Werner Institute. We are attending the second event of our series, A Feminist Exploration, Further online discussions in the coming weeks are planned and I'll announce those at the end of the session today. We, the, in the initiators of this series, are a network in the making, combining the work of feminist scholars, activists, advocates who collectively fight against the far right and attempt to create a strong bond of feminist solidarity all over Europe and also beyond. In this session, we will have Associate Professor of Demography, Lydia Ola of the Department of Sociology of Stockholm University, give us a mini lecture about demography, that is the study of populations, specifically from a feminist pers perspective to allow us an insight into its political implications. Before I give the word to our speaker, I just want to provide a quick overview from my own perspective on this subject. Um, the feminist focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights was itself originally rooted in demography. Um, way back, almost 26 years ago, um, uh, in 1994, the Cairo Program of Action on Population and Development ushered in what the, some of the first international soft norms on, so, on sexual and reproductive health and rights. This conference was originally first about population. This is often, uh, this constituted what is often referred to as a paradigm shift away from numbers and demographic targets, what was back then known in the 70s, 80s, and up into the 90s as population control, and placed the shift and the focus onto individuals, their rights, their human rights, and specifically women at the center of development. Since then, progressives have been very good at, uh, at expanding the area of human rights um, that has opened up since, uh, since these uh, landmark conferences, but at the same time have uh, not been as active in demographic spaces. And this has left populists with the, with the ability to fill in the void and to create what is almost an alternative demography. So today is an opportunity to recapture this field by getting a solid yet very accessible grounding in this important subject by a renowned demographer, our friend uh, uh, um, Livia Ola of Stockholm University that we'll be hearing from in a minute. Um, so please note that <coughs> this event will be recorded. Um, you'll be able to watch the, uh, all of the editions of the series on the YouTube channel of the um, Heinrich Böll Foundation. And also please uh, feel free to submit any questions via the Q&A tool that you have at the bottom of your screen. I'm imagining all of you are sufficiently familiar with Zoom by now that this is not a new function that you're discovering for the first time. Um, and now um, I'll pass the floor on to Livia Ola. Livia has been the initiator and the coordinator of research uh, of the research network Gendering European Fam uh, Family Dynamics and focuses her research on family demography and comparative perspective with an emphasis on men's role in the family, policy impacts of fertility and partnership dynamics, and the interplay of family patterns and societal and familial gender relations in European societies. So this is bound to be a very interesting uh, lecture from you, uh, Olivia. So I hand the floor over to you. You have a lot of material to take us through. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Neil. So I start uh, sharing the screen. And uh, yes, it works. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, demography, which is my favorite, uh, favorite subject. And as Neil has mentioned, demography is mostly about numbers, but uh, more recently we are paying more attention also to individuals, not only the numbers. So what's going on uh, behind the numbers? This is the agenda of my presentation, but let's start. So uh, what are the main uh, topics of demography? Obviously, um, demographers are obsessed with uh, populations, especially the world population. It has been a topic since historical time. Uh, we have been always interested whether uh, there are enough resources for the human population so we can live on. And as we can see on this diagram, it uh, was not really a big question 
up to nearly nowadays because human population was uh, rather limited in numbers. But then, as the means of production improved and um, we had better resources, uh, population has started to growing in accelerating numbers. And this uh, captured the attention of uh, demographers, often in a rather negative view, in a less than all alarmistic fashion, you can say. And one of the first people uh, in this uh, more pessimistic view was uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, who already at the end of the 18th century published his famous book um, about um, the principle of population. Uh, we were not even one billion uh, people at that time, but he already um, envisioned that a large population means poverty and human misery. And this view uh, has been along since Malthus, uh, and another famous follower of Malthus in 1968 uh, published a book, The Population Bomb. Uh, the author is Paul Ehrlich, an American biologist. He also followed this pessimistic view that uh, Malthus uh, scheduled, kind of, um, although we were only three billion people at that time when this book was published first. But um, Ehrlich already said that uh, we kind of um, uh, exposing natural resources to over exploitation because we are uh, human population, we are simply too many. We are stretching the food systems and uh, in the end, it might be also a danger for the climate. So now you can recall there are of course uh, important uh, climate changes we are facing now. And indirectly, it is indeed um, related to population size, but what matters more, it's the means of production, what we are using uh, for uh, our uh, living and to produce our living standard. So um, during this uh, time from this, the population bomb has been published and uh, now, today, we are now 7.8 billion people. So you can see also this diagram that yes, human population is increasing. And uh, we can say that uh, this increase is accelerating. So therefore, uh, many international organs are also interested, of course, that um, and organizations that um, when uh, will it end this increase, this rapid increase of the world population, or will it end at all? Uh, especially because, uh, of course, natural resources are limited. So this is a very valid and important question. According to the UN projection, uh, up to the uh, end of the 21st century, the human population will actually increase and um, uh, it will uh, reach uh, even 12 billion by the end uh, of the 21st century. But is it really so? We have also some more optimistic views Namely, a new study published by The Lancet this year came to a different conclusion. They actually project that the population growth will end, uh, the human population growth, by 2064. We will peak at 9.7 billion, so it's not like the UN projection at 5 billion. And after that, the uh, population on the Earth will decline, and by the end of the 21st century, we will be 8.8 billion. Of course, they take very much into account uh, how the age structure of the human population are changing uh, across the continents during time. And this diagram shows to you in the 1960s, uh, and so around the mid um, 20th century, it, we indeed had a very useful population on Earth. But uh, the median age, which means uh, every second person in the population is below that age, every second person is above that age. So uh, for Europe uh, as the first continent, we could see signs of what we call population aging already in the 1990s. And this, uh, this is accelerating because the median age is increasing, so we are not uh, a useful population anymore. But we can see uh, the same tendency also for the other continents. So the only exception is basically uh, Africa. 
uh, we see that they still will have a relatively low median age at the end of the 21st century, which means that uh, given the useful age structure, uh, many more new people will enter in reproductive ages, they can have uh, their own babies, so they still add the, to the population. Um, they still have uh, the possibility to grow. But uh, the rest of the world will already uh, beyond that stage. So how can we explain um, this, that there are differences? First, uh, certain regions, um, they already passed uh, the stage uh, that uh, I have just mentioned, this useful stage when the population is growing fast or grow, growing at all whereas other populations are still in the early stage and they are still growing very fast. Well, the theory of the demographic transition uh, tells us uh, that uh, human, that's human development, that um, uh, once upon a time, all human population had uh, experienced high births and death rates. But as the conditions improved, uh, hygiene um, and uh, also food, food supply other things, then um, the death rate started to decrease and also um, the birth rate started to increase. So through different stages in this transition process, human populations are uh, expected to reach another equilibrium at low births and death rates. And in fact, this um, last stage, this uh, stage five, uh, here it's even possible that uh, the population not only uh, will not able to reproduce itself as such, because um, the birth rate will be so low that it's, it is insufficient to the uh, simple uh, reproduction of the population. And that's the picture which shows, this is for stage five, this is actually what we are experiencing in the uh, more developed regions uh, in the world today. So we can see that a relatively large uh, portion of the uh, population in the more developed regions are actually in the um, retired segment of the uh, society. And um, if at the bottom of the population pyramid, uh, we have what uh, we call uh, too low fertility, too low in terms that uh, it's not even enough for a simple replacement of the population as such. So uh, in the long run, it means that the population will uh, implode, will uh, um, decrease. But uh, right now we have a demographic paradox because uh, globally, we still have the, uh, what Ehrlich called the population bomb. So human population is still um, increasing. And this is because uh, in the less developed regions, uh, we have uh, their population pyramids still have this uh, pyramid shape. Um, they have very high fertility. So it's, um, they add uh, more, much more people to the population than the ones who are living uh, through death. So this is the demographic paradox that uh, in uh, global terms, we have the population explosion, whereas for the most developed regions, we may have the concern of population implosion uh, to low fertility and um, how the um, population pyramid looks like in the different regions, it depends on which stage in the demographic transition a certain population right now is. But back to this uh, study, uh, which was published in the Lancet, um, because this is really interesting as uh, this is a study which says that for the first time that human population will stop growing already in this century. So uh, how come, uh, in what way they have done their projections differently than other um, international organizations? Well, they have built in into their models the main drivers of fertility change. And there are only two very important drivers. One is uh, women's educational level and the other is contraceptive use. It has been shown historically uh, where we have data for uh, all regions that um, the uh, women's educational level is actually increasing continuously. 
And we also know that the higher educational level the woman has, the fewer children she has. So it means that if the female educational attainment will continue to increase globally, then we certainly will have a fertility decline. The other driver, the contraceptive use, you can uh, see on this map that uh, only basically in a few countries in Africa where we still have a relatively high what we can call unmet need for contraception, which means that uh, still a relatively large share of uh, the female population who are in stable couple relationship and who are in reproductive ages and say that they don't want to have any uh, more children right now, yet they uh, still do not use any contraceptives. Whereas elsewhere in the world, we do use contraceptives. So, and also when we look back historically, uh, we can see that uh, the contraceptive usage worldwide, worldwide has been increasing. So it means, again, that uh, if this trend will continue, then we will uh, reach a declining fertility. So that's uh, how uh, they come up uh, in the Lancet article to uh, their uh, result that uh, based on these developments, it's actually possible that the human population will stop growing already in the 21st century. So uh, a little more about fertility. This is the picture for today, and it, it shows this map that right now, slightly more than half of the world's population live in countries with what we call below replacement fertility. So the average uh, number of children per woman is less than 2.1. And here a map uh, with a projection that by 2001, so by the end of 100, by the end of the 21st century, uh, it will be a very different situation. Only a few countries in Africa, which will have above replacement fertility level, and everywhere else we will have below replacement level. That's why human population will start to decline. And um, according to the projection, uh, this um, global um, total fertility rate will be as low as around 1.66 uh, children per woman on average. So given that we are heading towards uh, globally low fertility, um, there are consequences for the age structure, as uh, I have already started to explain in the previous slide. So it also means if we have lower fertility, then the age structure will change in the direction that we have population aging. So what's the big deal with uh, aging population? The big question is, of course, how many working age persons we have available to support each elderly person. This is the potential support ratio. And we see that in highly advanced economies, um, there is a rather steep decline in this potential support ratio. And in fact, uh, according to the projection, uh, it might come during the 21st century that it won't be uh, even two persons uh, of working ages who are supposed to support each elderly person. So we can understand that there are some concerns about both the dependency and the care burden, because when we have an aging population, then there will be much more demand on care, on care provision. Uh, the other side of this issue is the long-term economic competitiveness. We are living in an era uh, of very rapid technological development. And we know, perhaps also on, uh, or on our own experiences, that young people uh, much more quickly adapt to new technologies than elderly people. So if we have um, a, a working age population who are more often um, higher ages, whereas in other country, we have a more useful working age population, then these country uh, which have more young people in the labor force, they have a competitive advantage. Uh, because they, they can much more quickly adapt uh, to uh, this um, increasing means of volume, changing means of production and changing demands. 
So that's basically why we are interested about uh, the population age structure and how it develops. But so far we have only talked about, uh, my, uh, talked about the fertility and I briefly mentioned of course also um, the death rates, so mortality, but there is maybe a force which may, be, may provide a remedy for the labor and the care provider shortage, namely migration. And we can see here that um, the developed world is already relying on this, on migration in a quite a large extent. Because from the developing countries, well, the surplus of uh, the natural increase, the birth minus death, uh, many uh, young people are migrating to the developed world. Without such migration, Europe uh, or European population would have started to decline already. Um, in the long run, eventually, we still uh, will have the decline, but uh, at least um, when we receive many young people uh, migrating, we can still keep uh, the labor force uh, age structure uh, more useful as it would be um, on otherwise. But if we look at uh, what does it mean for the developing world, we know that migration is actually uh, selective. It's usually the most educated individuals, the most resourceful people who would leave, who would migrate at elsewhere. It means that the developing world will uh, maybe not have enough um, educated and resourceful people left for their own, to, to make their own um, economic uh, miracle. So that's definitely a headache, uh, the brain drain, what uh, we can also call. And uh, as I have already mentioned, the, the care, um, there is much discussion about the so-called global care chain. And this basically means that the women, because of course it's usually women who are um, involved in the care, care provider, um, these women who come from the developing world to the developed world, they often have their own children, but they don't bring their children with them um, to when they migrate. So these children are left behind for the care of grandparents or perhaps other relatives. So this is definitely a headache, how the, these children's well-being uh, can be ensured. And now uh, for the rest of the presentation, I will focus on Europe only and uh, not on the total population level, but I will go now to the family level, because there are some really interesting development that we are experiencing that basically on the aggregate level um, contribute to the bigger picture that we have seen uh, previously. In the mid 20th century, uh, it, it is actually known as the golden age of the family, because we had very stable and universal marriages. Uh, they were entered at young ages. In fact, family equaled basically married couple with children. That was the era of the male breadwinner model. So it was a one earner model. We, uh, gender roles were traditional. Women were confined to the household. And uh, of course, also to pro provide care for the children and the elderly. But uh, much has changed since this golden age. As we can see here, the marriage propensity declined because there are also other types of relationships we are increasingly entering before we enter marriage. And uh, most uh, notably is uh, non-marital cohabitation. We have seen a very rapidly increasing prevalence everywhere in Europe of non-marital cohabitation and increasingly also children are born in these unions. The problem is that uh, these relationships are more fragile than marriages. Hence, um, they can break up and they do break up in a much higher frequency than marriages do. But uh, there is a spillover also to marriages. As we can see, the rapidly increasing divorce rates everywhere, also uh, um, Southern Europe uh, starting to catch up lately. So it means that this is now uh, a new phenomenon that we have fewer later and less committed partnerships. 
we also uh, delay parenthood, which has a consequence that the family size is shrinking. So when we look at uh, what is the final family size for the different cohorts, the cohort means the uh, people born in the same year, we can see that for uh, German speaking countries and certain Southern European and some Eastern European countries, the final family size is actually at 1.5 children per woman on average, which in demographic terms is called the critical level of low fertility because below this critical level, we experience accelerated population aging. So this is definitely uh, an issue that uh, policymakers observed and uh, try to do something about it, so try to address. Um, when we have this very low fertility, it's often the case that also childlessness is increasing. And this is what we see in uh, the, uh, this diagram, that in many countries, especially uh, in German-speaking countries, we have alarmingly high level of childlessness. But uh, even uh, this is rapidly increasing in Southern Europe as well. And uh, of course, uh, this has something to do with the fact that we are waiting longer before we enter uh, parenthood and our reproductive capacity uh, will worsen when we um, wait longer. So um, maybe the children we imagined to have, we won't be able to have. Another uh, interesting uh, kind of side effect of this family development is that we have a large variety of families, not only the married nuclear family, but we have non-standard families, single parents, same-sex couples, step families, childless couples, and this is all related to new gender roles. So how gender roles have changed? Well, women increasingly participating at the labor market, the gender gap, uh, gender employment gap is rapidly diminishing. It's around 12% only in uh, Europe, in the EU, uh, the recent years. And this development is actually backed up by the increasing female educational attainment. You recall the Lancet article I have mentioned. So this can be also see in Europe that uh, young women, especially young women, are even more highly educated than their male counterparts. So the interesting uh, issue is here that whether the bargaining within the family will change, whether uh, these young women who are more highly educated than their male partner uh, will have a different position, whether they use their power in the negotiation in a way to perhaps um, demand the man's involvement in the family more as what is the case. And what are the demographic implications? Well, for uh, changing gender roles and fertility, it has been given much attention in research. And uh, up to the mid uh, or late 1980s, um, we have seen a negative correlation between these two um, uh, forces or variables. But after that, uh, what we see is actually the positive correlation, with, which means that it is the countries with a high uh, level of female labor force participation who also have reasonably high fertility, whereas uh, in countries where women uh, cannot uh, participate in the labor force uh, in sufficient numbers, they, they also have low fertility. Of course, uh, the explanation is basically that uh, in these countries, it's mostly the Scandinavian countries and highly advanced Western European countries, um, which have both high female employment rates and high birth rates. This is because they have uh, highly developed reconciliation policies as well. So uh, reconciliation policies do matter. We can see on this index um, that how well different countries manage on uh, work family reconciliation. Uh, the higher uh, the number, the better uh, the country is doing in this respect. And we see that uh, Scandinavian countries are the top of this um, work family uh, balance. And uh, so it's not a coincidence that they also have high fertility. Whereas these countries at the bottom of uh, this index, they also have dangerously low uh, fertility levels. 
So I already started to mention um, when we discuss uh, gender roles and reconciliation policies that uh, so far most changes have happened with women. The female gender roles have changed. It has expanded uh, that women do their uh, share, more than fair share in the family, and they also are economically active. They uh, contribute um, uh, by the, their labor market earnings to the family uh, income. And this is uh, certainly the case in Northern Europe, uh, where we have uh, uh, very highly developed reconciliation policies. And we see that this is actually very beneficial even for the age structure, because uh, we have a rather stable age structure in Northern European countries currently. And even in the future, um, we see not much distortion uh, in the age structure. There will be, of course, population aging. It's everywhere. But uh, fertility will be still uh, reasonable um, uh, high. But the other end of the scale, we see Southern Europe. And Southern Europe is the prime example with um, keeping traditional gender roles, not uh, uh, helping, not supporting women to uh, enter the labor force or to keep um, their positions there. And uh, so to have a more modern uh, gender dynamic, uh, the society is just not equipped in Southern Europe the same way as uh, it is in Northern Europe. And we see the result the age structure looks very different uh, compared to the northern european countries we already see the signs the clear signs of population aging and also the aging of the labor force and at the same time we also see that uh, very few young people are at the bottom of the population pyramid who will uh, sooner or later enter the labor market so what I have mentioned, the economic competitiveness, this is a real danger for Southern European countries. And in the long run, it gets worse, as we see here. By 2050, um, the uh, population age structure will be even more distorted. We have um, a top-heavy population pyramid. A, a large uh, segment of the population are uh, elderly. And we have um, a shrinking working age population and uh, basically uh, very little hope uh, when we look at the bottom of the pyramid to uh, escape this situation. So we may speculate that perhaps gender equality might be a path to societal sustainability. And by then, I, of course, refer to what we see in the Nordic countries that we have a rather stable uh, population age structure, although also in the long run. Um, we have uh, also have to take um, uh, into account that the family has changed. It's not only the married nuclear couple anymore, but we have so-called non-standard families. It means that uh, we have to think of their inclusion and exclusion, especially in legal terms. And of course, it uh, translates to social cohesion. Uh, one type of these non-standard families are same-sex partnership families who risk exclusion with respect to marriage, adoption, and parenthood. And uh, when it comes to parenthood, of course, uh, they have um, it in common uh, with uh, even heterosexual couples who have problems to conceive the involuntary childless. So the common solution for both these groups are the IRT, the assisted uh, reproductive technologies. Um, but when uh, we uh, discuss access to IRT, again, there are risks of exclusion by partnership status. In uh, many uh, countries and regions, only married and heterosexual couples uh, who have access to IRT. And uh, it is rather expensive, of course. So the question is whether uh, social insurance will cover a part uh, of the cost and how large part of the cost, uh, because otherwise only uh, the, the highest uh, socioeconomic strata of the uh, population who can have access to that. And um, these two um, picture here shows two databases which were produced in the uh, families and societies 
European project that uh, I uh, have headed between 2013 and 2017. Um, you can see um, these um, um, databases are actually freely available, so you can explore it yourself and uh, learn more about this topic. Then I also mentioned that our uh, partnerships are much less stable as they used to be. Um, we also have to keep in mind that often uh, the um, disruption of these relationships happens in reproductive ages. So people may repartner. And this repartnering um, happens uh, in, in these young ages or relatively young ages. So there may be uh, children in the family which are not shared by both partners of the couples. And the legal position of the children and the non-biological um, adult in the household is actually unclear. Uh, another headache with the, what we call step families or bonus families is of course that um, the um, doing of family, the everyday family life uh, is much more complex because it involves negotiations over several family households, not only within one household. So not surprisingly, uh, step families are even more fragile um, than ordinary families. Um, and uh, now just to, because my time is running out, uh, just to uh, come some, uh, with some take home message. So what we should remember, well, we have been discussing the family size, number of children per woman, uh, too low or too high fertility, but who decides what is too high or too low? Uh, what the woman has to say about it? And of course, this brings us also to reproductive rights. There are um, now much pronatalistic um, policies in the uh, developed countries, whereas for the developing world, the imposing family planning to them. We already discussed the downside of care migration, whether family is a fixed or a flexible concept. And finally, what gender has to deal with it? What kind of family support for a better demographic future we need? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Olivia. That was really wonderful. Um, you stayed perfectly on time, so thank congratulations. You. And, um, and when I saw your presentation yesterday, uh, in advance of everyone else, I was wondering, how is she going to be able to explain all of these very complicated graphs uh, in, in about half an hour? But uh, congratulations. I think you've done a very good job. If, thank we're you. All, if we were meeting in person, I think we, you deserve a round of applause about now. <laughs> but we can't do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, now we go to the Q&A. We've received a number of questions already, um, and they, they deal with the, num and the ones that have come in so far. We'll get to all of them, but the ones that have come in so far deal with a range of different subjects. Now, um, now maybe in order to contextualize them, um, I was wondering maybe if I, I'll take a moderator's uh, liberty and try to contextualize my understanding of the questions. Um, if we go back to that uh, slide that you had about the five stages of demographic uh, transition, you don't need to go back to it, but uh, if, you, ah, okay. if, you, if, if you just go I recall back. it, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe could you say a little bit about whether it is within the purview of states or governments to inter to in um, to um, intervene to alter the stages of uh, of demographic uh, transition, um, for example, a lot of uh, development work focusing on family planning or women's empowerment in the global south had the intention to accelerate the demographic transition, but we have a question here about some of the illiberal moves uh, taking place in Europe. Is it possible for governments to reverse the demographic transition? Okay, well, thank you. Very interesting question indeed. So let's start with, can, can we stop the demographic transition? Well, uh, certainly uh, we can uh, kind of modify the circumstances or we, by we, I mean the governments and the policies and these uh, big international programs uh, like the family planning programs that I have already mentioned, which are uh, directed towards the developing world. And basically we uh, foresee them with contraceptives, very effective contraceptives, but uh, it's a kind of a hidden message that we also want them to bring down their fertility level, of course. And so we are helping them or forcing them. It's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, what, we, uh, what we do. But um, 
And therefore, it would be interesting. This is really a feministic issue that um, uh, what the women have to say about it. Uh, do we allow them? Do they have a voice? And um, or do we want to reason with them? Because, of course, uh, it is uh, true that there are economic advantages with modernization, with smaller families. It is uh, kind of easier. Uh, you can accumulate wealth uh, much better compared to when uh, you have a large family. Um, but uh, maybe people have different priorities, different choices. So this is, again, one of the issues that the feminists may need to address and uh, discuss uh, together that do we have, you already mentioned, of course, the Cairo conference that uh, the emphasis is basically on human rights. So how would then this vision, uh, when we impose our uh, family view that uh, you only have a limited number of children uh, to an other culture that it is actually the opposite uh, is good that you have many children. That's what is wealth there. So how, how democracy works actually in, in this um, area. And uh, for the uh, illiberal democracies that you mentioned or the developed world, yeah, we certainly have seen uh, much backlash uh, in terms of women's reproductive rights because many governments try to kind of stop the clock in a way that they uh, introduce a ban uh, to abortion and maybe limit access to contraceptives. And they, uh, there are of course also campaigns uh, when uh, they try to uh, persuade uh, families to have many children because uh, this is their um, uh, civil duty for example, so we have all these kind of discourses. And then it's again that um, what we have to think that where is the individual woman, where is the voice of the family, where, where is human rights and women's rights in this discourse. Okay, but maybe, maybe a naughty question, okay? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, because with these the liberal governments, um, you know, we, we have a couple of them in Europe. Um, uh, and, they've, and it's not just about abortion, but also um, limiting access to contraception, promoting certain traditional family norms. Let's say if they were to go ahead with this, would they theoretically be successful in changing the demographic course of their country or not? As uh, a what, what do you think? Yeah, well, not really. I mean, what we have seen, because there were many pronatalistic uh, policies introduced in Europe, in different countries of Europe, uh, when uh, the government tried to bribe the families with uh, tax deduction or uh, certain cash benefits, and these were sizable cash benefits. And they might have a temporary effect. In a few years, this may work, when you have suddenly a baby boom. Uh, but in the long run, uh, this is not feasible because we come uh, to a certain um, level of development. We have a certain uh, view for ourselves, what we want to do in life. And um, it seems that women uh, in the developed world have learned that they want to have their own voice. They want to have their own income. They also want to have a family. Uh, so the problem is if they cannot um, have both, and that's what we see in Southern Europe, uh, where the government basically doesn't help them to, to have the cake and eat it, but uh, they, they are forced, whether they uh, choose a career or they choose babies. And what we see that they choose uh, neither. So they uh, do not participate in a sufficient number in the labor market, but they do not have babies either. So uh, this is kind of a backlash. This shows that it's much better, like the Scandinavian approach, that uh, you uh, make it possible for um, the families to both have uh, a foot at the labor market and also have the number of children they actually want to have. And there are, of course, uh, it's, these are very expensive um, um, things. Um, these uh, programs, both the, like the parental leave program and public childcare, but we see in the long run, um, as we have seen in the age structure, that this seems to work. So that's where the uh, development goes, and that's what we should ensure, not try to uh, turn back the clock to uh, the 1950s. Okay, perfect. So, so not only is it bad policies for women, but it's policies that won't actually meet demographic objectives. So that's, and that, 
Okay. This yes. brings me to, and your last point about, uh, um, brings me to another question that uh, came up here and to a slide on your, on, uh, to the last slide uh, uh, of your presentation, that about involuntary childlessness in Europe. And, um, and I think perhaps that would be an area of policy intervention that could be useful. And we have a question here about um, access to ARTs and also um, uh, about expanding, um, about addressing the question of adoption laws, which, uh, which has been left out. Um, would you have anything to say about, um, about adoption laws, access to ARTs and then um, involuntary childlessness? So uh, what, what, have, uh, what we see is um, because of these family developments that I have described that the people are waiting longer to uh, start parenting or uh, to have a child. And then it means that they often, when they finally feel ready financially, economically, uh, and other way to have a family, then may they discover that their reproductive uh, capacity uh, is deteriorating and they cannot have. Uh, uh, children on their own. And uh, then, of course, that this like the economic issues uh, uh, comes in because uh, IRT is really uh, expensive. So in certain countries, the government steps in and they finance uh, these uh, treatments or a large portion of these treatments. But in many other countries, this is not the case. So uh, in, in these countries, only the affluent families uh, can take advantage of IRT and not uh, the less educated and less well-off segment of the population. So then it means that there is the social cohesion. We are kind of uh, selecting the population that who are allowed to reproduce. So these are really important also democratic questions, of course, um, that we have to have in mind. Adoption, you mentioned also, right? Um, well, for adoption, uh, what, as uh, I uh, mentioned that it's a kind of shortage of babies in, in uh, Europe. So it's often these babies who are for adoption, they, uh, they are coming from the developing world. And so it means that, uh, and there are a lot of uh, research on that, that uh, how these babies can uh, feel at home in our world, so to say, because we know you also mentioned um, at your introduction that uh, we have an increasing um, uh, far right uh, wing in uh, Europe everywhere. And of course, um, they usually point uh, towards the, the visible minorities. And of course, these children would be visible minority. So then how can they feel at home in this culture, uh, even though they will be brought up here because they are adopted early, when uh, political forces uh, will turn against them. So there are, again, uh, many things that uh, around adoption as well, and also how freely, uh, really, families would give up their children for adoption. Are we forcing them or what's going on? Yeah. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions on population, overpopulation and link and how this relates to access to resources and, uh, and uh, environmental sustainability. So first, uh, and they, come in, they come in differently. I'll try to regroup them in a certain logical order. So first, could you tell us a little bit about what is the current thinking right now in the field of demography about the notion of overpopulation? Um, well, as I already mentioned, um, in, in demography, we, we do believe, or most uh, people do believe, that um, uh, the global um, population will stop growing. Mm -hmm. The question is when. And so then, there, there for this uh, Lancet study uh, that I have mentioned in my presentation, it really uh, received uh, huge attention because this is the first study which says that this will happen already in this century, so within our lifetimes, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. All the other projections, they, they uh, postpone it much further. And then, as I mentioned, the UN projection that uh, they suggested that the uh, human population can uh, grow up to, up to 12 billion. Uh, of course, if the Earth's resources are stretched already now, how would it be with 12 billion people? So uh, we, can, we can imagine that even though this is not a direct uh, linkage, but there is an indirect linkage. So it does matter how many people we are on Earth. So this is a kind of good news that um, the, the Lancet study that um, within our lifetime, uh, human population will start um, uh, or will stop 
uh, growing and then we can see already a, a decline uh, at the end of the 21st century. So this is definitely good news for the environment. And related to this, um, uh, in this notion about overpopulation um, and this being problematic, what about, isn't that sort of blending out the fact that more people would create more resources and opportunities? Well, I, this is this, before, so have I, but no, no, this is an old debate in demography. Actually, I mentioned Malthus uh, the, and the pessimist, uh, but there are also the population optimists. And uh, we, uh, Esther Bozeruk, for example, in uh, the early 19th century, this was precisely her argument that she said that when you have to innovate because you are too many and you don't have enough resources, then you will be much more innovative because you are forced to do that. So it will actually help human development. Mm -hmm. So this is certainly part of the package. We don't know which way it will go, but we, we do know uh, that uh, the, the climate change is a very pressing issue. Uh, the carbon emission is too high and that is actually related to the uh, population size. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you. Um, another question that we have here is about um, um, sexuality educations in school and what role does that play in fertility rates? Well, this, of course, uh, what, uh, what is the content of the sexual education in school? Uh, because, as I said, uh, it's not the meaning that we, are, we should force people to uh, choose one way or the other how they want to plan their family, but we need to provide them with the knowledge. And unfortunately, in many countries, maybe um, the sexual education does not really uh, live up to, to that, to really educate um, the pupils on the, what kind of choices they have, what are the consequences of the different choices they will have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, very good. Um, I'm trying to get through as many questions as possible before we, ha we have to wrap up. We have one question that uh, on an issue that hasn't uh, come up uh, yet, um, men's roles um, in the family. Yeah, yeah and, and that's basically my research area, but for this introductory uh, yeah. 30 minutes presentation, there was not enough time, but uh, it's certainly both in developing countries demography and in the developed countries demography now, this is an issue that uh, more and more uh, researcher discovers that we do have to pay attention to that because uh, even uh, fertility is not only about women. Uh, there are, as I already mentioned, there is a negotiation going on uh, with the, within the couple and uh, how we can reason uh, both with the woman and the man that what is the best, uh, what is their best interest and what is the best interest of their future children. So we, we cannot only address one part of the family, we do need to involve uh, both parts. And um, uh, now I uh, uh, get back again to Scandinavia, because um, this is the part of Europe uh, where um, the concept of gender equality has been very consequently implemented already uh, since basically the late 60s. Uh, Sweden was, for example, the first country in the world introducing parental uh, leave not only maternity leave, parental leave, making possible even for fathers from the very first day in the baby's life to stay at home on paid leave with the baby. So it's up to the family negotiation what they want to do. And if the uh, family decides that the father will stay at home with the baby, so be it. So, and and uh, it uh, has shown the research that this has actually rather beneficial consequences because uh, this early bonding between the father and the child, it will help also in the long run that even if the family would uh, split up, uh, these fathers would not disappear from the children's life, but they still keep in contact in much higher frequency than uh, the other fathers who were not having this early bonding in their, with their children. And um, also we have seen more and more research is actually showing that uh, when the father takes parental leave, so have this possibility with the early bonding uh, with their children, then the family cohesion is stronger. So the breakup rate is actually lower in such families. It, I'm not saying that this is because the father took parental leave because obviously it's, it's a very complex decision. So there are different factors behind it. 
but uh, it means that the father's roles matter as much as uh, the mother's role in the family and for uh, the children's well-being and development. Yeah. Okay, good. We'll go back to illiberal, democracy, illiberal <laughs> democracies for a bit, and then I'll have one last question. So, um, and for illiberal democracies, we have two questions related to that. So one is promoting a certain type of um, <coughs> gender norm and family ideal, a way of gaslighting women and societies in those countries. And then also um, in these illiberal democracies, um, if women choose not to have careers or babies, what else can they choose? What are the options left to them? So well, ni neither babies nor, uh, nor career. Nor yeah, nor enter the labor market. So okay, well, I mean, it's it's up to everyone, of course, what kind of choices they make in their lives. But uh, uh, the basic message is that uh, the governments should rather empower people uh, to make um, um, reasoned choice and not try to force uh, a particular uh, way upon them. But uh, what we have seen, and as what I have mentioned, but the development seems that we are really heading towards the dual learner family. And uh, this is backed up by also that we have these non-standard family types. So uh, even if one enters marriage, uh, it's not certain that um, this marriage will last forever. So we have to be prepared that every single adult individual will have to or should be able to support him or herself and his or her own children as well. So the best way is, of course, that we make it possible um, that both women and men participate in the labor market. But, but we should also make possible to them to have the children they want to have. But we should not enforce uh, to them to have children because that is, it's also a free choice if someone decides uh, not to have children. Of course, it, with the IRT, I discussed usually the involuntary childlessness, but we have to be aware of that some people make a conscious decision to, uh, to decide because of where population in the world that they don't want to add to that. They don't want to have children. And it doesn't mean that they are not useful members of the society because they may be very much involved in other people's children for their siblings children or their friends children and be around and help them so it doesn't mean that uh, the voluntarily childless people will decide not to have any contact and not to provide any help to children this is something uh, that also needs a more nuanced debate because uh, sometimes there is a kind of hate which has misunderstanding towards uh, the people who de uh, decide to be voluntarily childless mm -hmm. yeah. thank you perfect um Let's see, one question that we had also was about reproductive justice and making, um, making uh, uh, addressing the reproductive needs of, uh, of all, you know, of women of all different uh, colors, trans, uh, trans uh, individuals as well, and also looking at, um, at this issue from an anti-racist uh, perspective. Does this, have a, uh, does this perspective have a role in the discourse on demography? Well, um, not, not really, and that's why the feminist uh, perspective needs to be brought in, because uh, as I said, even um, with respect to IRT, uh, this, uh, the regulation, if it exists at all, it's uh, very heavily, it's a kind of el elitistic, so that the most affluent who have the resources, they can have access to IRT, but not the rest of the society. So then it, um, it really brings uh, in these uh, negative uh, feelings from the, uh, well, um, like the Second World War, when we were selecting that who are the good people and uh, other people who are not allowed to reproduce. So this, these kind of issues are very important to discuss and be conscious about it because certainly and the same is with the sexual minorities of course that uh, for example uh, surrogacy is an extremely controversial issue but for a gay couple there is no other way to have children of course so uh, is it are they exploiting a woman a surrogate mother who would produce a baby for them or so it's, it's, there is no simple answer, but uh, this is definitely uh, questions that we need to address and there might be the answer different uh, for different individual cases. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much.
I think we've come to our time now. We're just one minute over, but uh, but already there's been a lot of different questions, and um, and I feel like I'm grilling you during an exam. So as a as a professor, it must be a different. Uh, feeling to be on the other side of, uh, of uh, getting the questions like this. So, uh, but so thank you very much. Um, I, think, uh, I, I think it's important to emphasize also that what you provided was a very basic elementary introduction to a whole field of science. So um, if those of you who are interested, um, hopefully this has whetted your appetite to learn more. And, um, and also, so, um, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, we will be continuing discussions on this issue, and um, I've been instructed to announce the next lex the next uh, lecture of the uh, the Heinrich Boll Foundation, which will be with uh, uh, Judith uh, Getz on the Great Replacement. So we didn't get a chance to discuss that today. Um, it should be very interesting. The Great Replacement is one of these fringe um, alternative demography uh, far right theories about the yeah. doomed falling uh, Europe. So now that you have your grounding in understanding basic proper demography, then the participants here who are interested in, in deepening their understanding of this can go into the next session, which will be on the 16th of uh, September, and to, uh, to uh, attempt to deconstruct how demography as a science has been misrepresented and misused and also misapplied to, uh, to justify certain uh, limitations on human rights. So, but so thank you very much, uh, Livia Ola. Uh, thanks to you, we've learned about the basics of demography, demographic transition. Um, we also know that these illiberal attempts, not only are they bad for women, but they're bad demographic policies. And we have optimistic news about an eventual population stabilization. And, uh, and then still many open questions about links, uh, about interconnections with the uh, sustainability, climate, uh, and, um, and also other bio bioethical questions that you raised at the end. So thank you very much. And I'll end the, the discussion here. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.